If you break the law, there are supposed to be consequences. Prison, community service, a fine, whatever. But punishing someone is deliberately inflicting suffering on them. And normally, we say that inflicting suffering on people is bad. So how is legal punishment justified? How do we take breaking the law and translate that into punishment? There are two major types of theories that philosophers of law use to answer this question. The first is consequentialism. Punishing you aims at some good consequence. That might be deterrence, deterring other people from committing crimes. It might be reform, stopping you from doing it again. Or it might be something else. But the idea is that the punishment is justified because it achieves some good end. The second theory is retributivism. When you break the law, you morally deserve to be punished. It might also bring about some good consequence, but it's not really important whether or not that happens. What matters is that you deserve to suffer. One of the advantages of consequentialism is that it's easy to measure and test. So if the goal of our punishment system is reform, we can test the number of criminals that become repeat offenders and say, okay, this type of punishment isn't working, let's try something else. Or we can say, oh look, this country has experimented with this kind of punishment and their crime rates have gone down, so let's try something similar here. We can also build a scale for punishing people. So for instance, if we know that 20 years in prison doesn't reform shoplifters any more than two years in prison, or well, we know that there's no point in imprisoning shoplifters for more than two years. We can figure out which punishment will be the best value and the most effective. Retributivism can't do that so easily. It says you should get what you deserve, which prompts the question, what do you deserve? We don't want to punish you too harshly or too leniently. So how do we figure out your just deserts? Let's have a look at some different ways of finding out what criminals deserve. First up, an eye for an eye. This is one of the oldest retributivist ideas. In fact, it's over three and a half thousand years old, dating back at least to the ancient Babylonian Code of Hammurabi. You can find it in the Torah, the Quran, and the Bible, and in fact, some countries still use it today. The technical term for it is lex talionis, the law of retaliation. And the idea is that the punishment is justified if it takes the same form as the crime. So if you kill someone, you will be killed. If you blind someone, you will be blinded, and so on. But the problem with Lex Talionis is that sometimes it's impossible to inflict on the criminal what they did to the victim. Some legal crimes are technically victimless, like dangerous driving that doesn't actually hit anybody. How do you recreate that? Or tax fraud? Or illegally downloading music? Also, it might seem a little bit hypocritical if the crime is actually morally wrong. Like if beating somebody to death is an evil thing to do, why is it suddenly okay to do it just because the person did it to someone else first? I mean, at the very least, you need to come up with some kind of explanation of that. So we could try modifying Lex Talionis to say that the punishment is justified if it causes an equal amount of suffering to the crime. So if you blind somebody, we're not literally going to take your eyes, but we will do something to you that will cause an equal amount of nastiness. Trouble is though, suffering isn't easy to measure. It doesn't come in kilograms or inches. And if you're a particularly tough person, you might be more easily able to bear suffering than somebody else. So still, this doesn't really help us practically decide what punishments we should inflict on people. The next step after Lex Talionis is usually proportionality. That's where we say that the punishment is justified if it's proportional to the crime. A worse crime deserves a harsher punishment. The trouble with that, though, is that we are going to need some justified punishment to act as our measuring stick. Otherwise, it's difficult to know what we should inflict on people. So, for instance, if murder gets you 10 years in prison, and shoplifting gets you one year in prison, why isn't it murder gets you 10 minutes in prison, and shoplifting gets you one minute? Because that's still in proportion. There are other ways of trying to figure out how much criminals deserve to suffer, but they all have their disadvantages. So Russ Schaefer Landau takes a different approach. He says there isn't actually an answer to this question. There are no facts of the matter about how much a criminal deserves to suffer, any more than there could be facts about what colour the number nine is. This position is called moral desert nihilism. And this leaves Schaefer Landau with the apparently bizarre conclusion that criminals do not deserve to suffer. And once you take hold of it, that can seem like a very weird idea. Murderers don't deserve to suffer? Thieves don't deserve to suffer? If Stalin or Hitler were on trial, they really wouldn't deserve to suffer? 
This can seem like a very weird idea, that punishment is not actually morally justifiable. And you might well say, well then why not just let them all out? Why not let all the criminals go? Because none of their punishments can be justified. Or alternatively, why not put people to death just for littering? If there are no facts of the matter about how much a criminal deserves to suffer, then no punishment could be too lenient or too harsh. But those responses all assume that there is some morally justified level of punishment which is exactly what the moral desert nihilist is denying. So although they seem very intuitive and obvious, they actually beg the question. The challenge for the moral desert nihilist is to show that punishments can be too harsh or too lenient or take the wrong form because of something about them that is nothing to do with moral desert, i.e. to become some form of consequentialist. Legal punishments might still end up causing suffering, and it might be the case that that suffering is an inevitable result of the good consequence of the punishment which outweighs it, while still not being morally deserved. Interestingly, there is actually a third theory, which is neither fully consequentialist nor fully retributivist, called communicative punishment, and we'll have to go into that one another time. In this video, we've looked at two different ways of trying to justify legal punishment, retributivism and consequentialism. Patreon.com slash philosophytube is where you can chuck me a couple of bucks if you want to help me give away more free philosophy education on YouTube. Leave me a comment telling me which theory you'd prefer, or maybe you can come up with a different one. And as always, please don't forget to subscribe. Mm -hmm.